like to thank you for joining our webinar today. This is Carla Gagne I'm with Exosome Diagnostics, and I'm here to introduce the program, the ExoDX Prostate Test, a paradigm shift for prostate cancer and implications for value-based care. So we're pleased and privileged to have Dr. Jason Alter and Dr. Judd Mal uh, join us. Um, J Dr. Jason Alter is our head of clinical affairs and will be giving, giving an overview of um, exosome diagnostics, the epi test, and some new data from our clinical utility study. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jason Alter. Thank you, Carla. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining. Uh, this morning, if I could have the next slide, what we'd like to review Thank you. What we'd like to review is a very brief mention of exosome science, a little bit of the highlights of our validation studies, which have been in the public domain for some time, an introduction to a fascinating and unique clinical utility study that has just been accepted. So this is the first time that you'll be seeing any of this data. And then shifting to a real world analysis from Dr. Mal and his clinical practice. So with that, let's jump right in. The, there is a significant national need to understand which patients truly require a biopsy or not, because most annual biopsies result in either benign results or low-grade disease, defined as Gleason score of six, also called Gleason grade group one. So it's not an innocuous procedure. There are complications associated with biopsy that range from pain and fever to hematospermia, and one that is of particular concern to me, which is a rising rate of sepsis, even or despite post-antibiotic prophylactics, prophylaxis. In fact, one in 20 men regret having a biopsy, and there are studies that show that 14% of patients uh, had complications that were worse than they actually expected. And finally, there's poor compliance with physician recommendations to have a biopsy or to defer a biopsy. And that became particularly clear with our clinical utility study that we'll show you in a minute. Next, please. So exosomes are a fascinating area of science and we could talk for quite some time just on that. But for today, we're gonna to narrow it to one slide, which is that exosomes are double bilayer vesicles on the order of the size of viruses that are released by all living cells into virtually all biofluids. We collect them in the urine, but you can find them in the blood and other fluids as well. They are fascinating because they contain RNA, DNA, and protein, and they actually prove to be excellent for diagnostic needs because they allow for real-time monitoring of patient biology. In normal health, Exosomes are now known to be critically important in cellular communication. In addition to the other forms of classical cell communication, such as hormone signaling and gap junctions, uh, exosomes are actually a new mechanism for cell communication. And they also allow for molecules to be secreted from cells that are not normally secreted and travel quite some distance in the body to provide uh, that signal at a distant point. So, Exosomes are fascinating, but how are we looking at them clinically? Next slide, please. So exosomes are the basis of the ExoDX prostate test, also known colloquially as EPI. It is a non-DRE or a non-digital rectal exam, urine-based liquid biopsy that analyzes the RNA expression of three specific biomarkers, PCA3, ERG, and SBDEF. And these three biomarkers have been linked to high-grade prostate cancer, which is defined as Gleason grade group two or higher, or you could think of it as Gleason score of seven or higher. And it is focused exclusively in men that are 50 years or older and have a PSA of between two to 10 nanograms per mil, which is the gray zone, it's called the gray zone, because within the PSA range of two to 10 nanograms per mil, it's really impossible to know which of these patients really have cancer, which of these patients will have high grade or low grade or any cancer upon biopsy. Now, what's critically important to remember is that the epi test or ExoDX assessment does not require any clinical features to provide a result. 
this test is unique because it is a test that only relies on the genomic information to give a, uh, an answer. It does not incorporate any clinical features. And in our validation studies, it has been proven to be more accurate than any of the currently available clinical assessment tools or PSA that's widely used. It has a sensitivity of 92% and a negative predictive value or NPV of 91.3%. Its scale goes from 1 to 100, and as you go up the scale from 1 to 100, the risk of high-grade cancer increases. The cut point, or the threshold of 15.6, is the place below which the epi, uh, below which there's a very li a decreased likelihood of having high-grade prostate cancer defined as a Gleason score of 7 or higher. So below 15.6, very low risk of high-grade cancer. And above the 15.6 threshold, the risk actually increases the further up the scale you go. Next slide. There are two validation studies that deserve a session in their own right, and some of you may be familiar with them and some not. But the first validation study was published in JAMA Oncology in 2016. And what it showed was that the 15.6 threshold that we just talked about has been validated to be more accurate than current clinical assessment and to be able to find patients that are likely to have low-grade Gleason score 6 cancer or benign disease from patients with high-grade prostate cancer, again, Gleason score 7 or higher. These two clinical validation studies focused exclusively on the intended use populations, men over 50, PSAs between 2 to 10 nanograms per mil, and represented collectively more than 1,000 patients from 24 urology clinics with multiple physicians across the United States. As mentioned, the first study published in JAMA Oncology in 2016, and the second validation independent published in European Urology in 2018 demonstrated that when the test was used as indicated, that below the cut point, you would reduce biopsies for patients unlikely to have high-grade prostate cancer by 27%. So, these two validation studies collectively showed that the epiassay was associated with improved identification of patients with higher grade prostate cancer in the PSA gray zone. Next slide. There's a lot of data in those studies, but the only piece that I'd like to show you is the area under the curve, which is the balance between sensitivity and specificity that's commonly used to show accuracy in these types of assays. And XODX by itself was significantly better. Remember that blue bar is simply the accuracy of the genomic markers when compared to a standard of care, SOC, optimized model, which was 0.63, that was the next best. And then followed by several calculators that are publicly available, PCPT and ERSPC are two different calculators that combine clinical information together. And then of course, PSA. And in the clinic, the majority of how clinicians practice, and I will defer to my colleague, Dr. Mao, is often with simply with PSA. But the bottom line is that compared to any of the existing tools that are available, uh, the genomic markers and the epiassay were significantly more accurate than any of them. Next slide. And the epiassay, as we mentioned earlier, as the score increases on the x-axis, you can see the score go from zero to greater than 60. As the score increases, you see the risk increase. On the y-axis is the percentage probability of high-grade prostate cancer. And so as the score goes up, you can think of it roughly as an increase in the percentage risk of prostate cancer. And below, again, the 15.6 threshold, very low likelihood of having high-grade prostate cancer, the negative predictive value, again, is 91%, which means that the confidence in telling any individual patient that they have high-grade prostate cancer, that they don't have high-grade prostate cancer when they're below 15.6 is 91.3% certain. Next slide. Now I'd like to quickly go over the CARE FIRST, our, our news CARE FIRST study, that is our clinical utility study, and the study goal was to assess the XODX prostate impact or the epi impact on shared physician 
patient decision making for biopsy decisions. There is a lot of data in this study, and we're only going to touch upon some of the key points now. And we look forward to sharing this with you individually uh, once you've had a chance to review the paper as we move forward. Study design was a multi center clinical utility study. You see its clinical trial number there that was done in partnership with Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield of Maryland. The inclusion criteria were critically important, were still the identical to the validation study inclusion criteria. Men 50 or older with PSAs in that gray zone of 2 to 10 scheduled for initial biopsy. And a really key point is that this is the first ever, to our knowledge, prospective randomized prostate cancer biomarker utility study with a blinded control arm. And that's really critical because the findings from this study are unique, and I believe it's because this is the first study to actually do a blinded control arm as part of the study. Next slide. In prostate. Next slide, please. Thank you. Study flow was essentially that if you read with me, and the numbers will appear on the figure, patients were enrolled in urine collected based on standard clinical criteria. All subjects actually had an epi test but were randomized into an epi or a control arm. But only the epi arm patients received the results with their physician. Nobody was notified in advance about the results. Nobody knew which arm they would be randomized into. In the epi control arm, the urologist received the test results immediately prior to review with the patient during the final evaluation and making those biopsy decisions. But in the control arm, the urologist received a notification that there was not going to be an epi result provided, and they continued having a discussion about biopsy per the standard of care metrics that they've been using. So everyone received, everyone had an epi test performed, but the control arm did not receive their results. We had the results of the epi uh, test for the, for the control arm for our own analysis. So this was a randomized blinded controlled study with a control, blinded control arm. Next slide. Uh, if you look at how the epi arm broke out, and again, it's a lot of information, and I'll go through it very quickly. There were 458 subjects in the epi control, excuse me, in the epi arm itself. 93%, excuse me, 93 of those patients were low risk. That, were, that means they were below the 15.6 cut point and 63% of those patients were recommended to defer their biopsy and did so with a very high compliance rate of 92%. Now, the compliance rate was also high in patients above the epi cut point. 72% of patients complied with their physician's desire or recommendation to have a biopsy. So compliance was much higher in the epi arm than in the control arm. The remaining 37% of the epi low-risk subjects were recommended to have a biopsy, and 44% ultimately decided to defer biopsy. In total, 69 subjects, representing 74% of all epi low-risk subjects, ended up deferring their biopsy. And the results can actually be seen in the next slide. So, the, the way to look at this slide is the epi scores are along the bottom, uh, along the x-axis, and the percent of patients who had a biopsy are on the y-axis. The control arm is the mustard arm, and essentially the control arm had about 39% of those patients had biopsies. The, this, the cut point of 15.6 is indicated with the yellow arrow. That is the place at which the epi arm has been validated for these decisions. Below the cut point in the green circle, only 26% of the epi low risk subjects proceeded with a biopsy compared to 39% in the control arm. And above the 15.6 cut point, due to the increased compliance there as well, the number of biopsies, the recommendation to have biopsies were adhered to more strongly and there was a higher rate of biopsies. And then when you had an epi score of greater than 30, it actually indicated an increased risk of high, finding high-grade cancer relative to the standard of care factors in the control arm. 
And essentially what this chart says is that below the cut point, patients that were unlikely to have high-grade disease listened to the doctor's recommendations, had a very high compliance rate, and with their shared decision-making, decided not to have a biopsy, and they were the right people that could afford uh, could avoid it. Above the cut point, there was an increased biopsy rate because they were more likely to uh, need a biopsy, and they also complied with their physician recommendations. So how does this translate? If you were to net this out on the next two slides, which are the results of the study, the first point would be more about the study itself and the design. No other biomarker has actually published findings with a current real-time control arm in prostate cancer, to the best of our knowledge. This is the first ever prospective randomized prostate cancer biomarker study with the blinded control arm. And a key learning from this study was that there's a misperception about the reality of biopsy reduction. Pure biopsy reduction is not possible if the biomarker is correlated to high-grade prostate cancer because the prevalence of high-grade prostate cancer is actually higher than the biopsy rate. The biopsy reduction below the biopsy rate will result in more high-grade prostate cancer, which was found in the control arm of this study. So, the, But what does translate and come out of this study is that better care is the actual result. Biopsies are being provided to the right patient at the right time. And that's emphasized now in the second control, uh, second, excuse me, results set slide. This study confirms that ExoDX prostate or EPI can help select the patients, the right patients at the right time for biopsy, deferring where necessary and suggesting which patients should more likely go for a biopsy. Below the ExoDX cut point, there's a strong biopsy deferral with strong patient compliance, 92%, and 23% of those patients deferred their biopsy due to epi. Above the exosome DX cut point, we found 30% more high-grade cancer as a result of increased compliance to biopsy compared to the control arm. This has resulted in improved quality of care, and we believe cost savings, because as voiding biopsy is appropriate, as well as finding high-grade prostate cancer earlier, in more relevant patients. One of the data points to support that is in some two and a half year follow-up data, there is a demonstrated reduction in repeat biopsies in patients that had results below the DX uh, cut point of 15.6. So now look quickly, how does this translate into real world clinical evidence? Next slide. What you're seeing here is 125 case results, exosome DX case results from Duke Urology. I'm about to turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Mao. These 125 patients are uh, the scores you see on the y-axis. These are the scores of the exodx result. 25% of these patients in real clinical practice came in below the threshold of 15.6. And if you look at what that translates to next, if you look at what that translates to in terms of the percent published percentages of biopsy complications, this translates into about 31 of these 125 men avoiding a biopsy when they were only likely to find either benign tissue or low-grade Gleason 6 cancer. Two and a half uh, men, based on the percentages, would avoid biopsy pain. A little more than eight men would avoid hematospermia. About 0.6 men, because the numbers here are so low in terms of overall men, would avoid hospitalization. And somewhere between uh, one to eight percent, or up to two and a half men, would avoid sepsis simply based on published numbers. From a cost perspective, this translates just with trust 12 core biopsies to about 1,405 per case, or $43,000 or a little bit more than $43,000 in total. Next, that's only if trust biopsies are looked at. If you look at adding sedation to a trust biopsy, which has increased costs, or inbore MRIs, or fusion biopsies, or even transperineal biopsies, you see that the costs actually do increase. So there are significant cost savings that could be made for patients who fall below this threshold. Next. And with that, I think that I'd like to also ask you to consider that there's a very 
different type of shared decision making that goes on between a physician and a patient depending where they fall on this curve. If you're at one end of the spectrum versus the other, the conversations are very different.